beautiful song. Um, so as Kadisha said in her welcome, um, this past week has been the Adventist Youth Week of Prayer. Um, so AY groups around the world have gathered together in their local churches to discuss a variety of different topics. Um, so day one was about the importance of the word of God. Day two was by grace alone. Day three was Christ as the center of our lives. Day four was the church as a priesthood of all believers. Day five was the Lord's Supper creates fellowship. Day six was the confession of my sin and guilt. And day seven was baptism, a new covenant with Jesus. And we're going to wrap it up all today with day eight. Christ is returning to bring salvation and judgment. Waiting can be so exciting. Do you remember what it was like when you had to wait several months or even several years for someone who had become very dear to your heart? Your thoughts kept turning to that dear person again and again. You have probably taken advantage of every possibility to keep in touch with that person. Whenever you had the chance, you, said you sent some kind of message, maybe even pictures. And if it wasn't too expensive, you probably talked on the phone as much as possible. But that only made the longing get even stronger, but in particular, also the joyful expectation of seeing each other again. Certainly, you did everything you could to get ready for the moment of reunion and make it really special. You spared no expense and perhaps bought the most beautiful flowers you could find and some small thoughtful gift. Of course, something that you knew the other person would really appreciate. And then, as you were waiting in the arrival hall of the airport, everyone could tell by the eager expectation on your face that there was a lot of love involved. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Um, we pray that as I preach the word that you will speak through me so that I can bless someone in this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so there is a painting that I would like to put on the screen, and it's called the Reformation Altar. So the world was standing on the verge of the Protestant Reformation, and it was a world full of fear. Life was uncertain, and the average life expectancy was probably only about 40 years. Many children died before even reaching adulthood. Outbreaks of the plague kept arising again and again, and no one could explain why. Almost no one could ever escape this and many other diseases. It was fruitful ground for superstitions, and many took advantage of the fears of others to make a profit. In addition to all that, wars also claimed many victims. There were hardly any social welfare systems to provide support in personal emergencies. The traditional worldview no longer provided any certainty that Constantinople, the capital of Christian Byzantine Empire, fell to the Islamic Ottoman armies in 1453. And a whole new world was found as America was discovered in 1492. The world seemed to be falling apart and life was uncertain. Since the renowned German astronomer and mathematician Johann Stoffler, predicted the end of the world for February 2nd, 1524, based on, special constellation, um, based on a special constellation of the stars, many believed they were facing their final hours. Since the influential church Father Augustine had taught that the kingdom of God is already fully manifest in the church, the biblical understanding of the second coming had become fundamentally changed. There was nothing left to look forward to because the end would only bring the judgment of God. And that was something you had to be afraid of. So every aspect of life was full of fear. It is only against this background that we can begin to understand Martin Luther's preoccupation with the fundamental question that started the Reformation. How can I receive the grace of God? Why was he so worried about whether God would accept him? It was the fear of being rejected by God at the last judgment. So our question about Martin Luther's understanding of the second coming of Jesus is very closely connected with the central message of the Protestant Reformation. So here we can see the Reformation altar, um, which also bears the depiction of the final judgment. It is found on the back of the predella. There we see a scene, somewhat faint and in drab colors, depicting the two groups of people that will be found at the second coming of Jesus. And we can also find this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 31 to 46, um, what Sister Chanel did, Chanel did, sorry, read for scripture reading. So on the left, there are those who will be saved. 
They're up to the necks in water, but they are looking to the uplifted snake and thus to Jesus Christ. Thus they are saved. On the right, there are those who are lost. They still look cheerful and lively and busy. There's a lot of action going on, but all their business is without meaning or purpose. And if you look closely, you can almost imagine how they have their last cry on their lips. They are lost. It seems as if the painter himself was a bit disquieted by the scene. That's why there are no bright or contrasting colors. And Luther's contemporaries also couldn't really appreciate the scene because it touched on their own fears. How can you ever be certain that you will be among those who will be saved? If you look closely, you will see that this panel of the Reformation altar is covered with writing and dates, more on the left than on the right. Since about 1555, the students of the theological faculty at the university immortalized themselves here after their final exams. Those who had passed could count themselves among the saved and write his name on the left side, but those who did not pass could only find a place for their name among the lost, who now had to face the final judgment. We may smile at this custom, but it clearly documents how the contemporaries of Martin Luther but, ev but even more so the following generations, had not been able to communicate the reformers' liberating understanding of the second coming of Christ to their children. Um, so now, as this is the Youth Week of Prayer, um, I would like to ask that we break into small groups and that we pray. So towards the end of his life, Luther reported that as a young man, he had a terrible fear of Judgment Day. That was what his parents had taught him, and in general, that was the way most people felt about it. That's why he was so anxious about it later on as a monk, and why he tried so hard to live without sinning so that he would not be rejected in the judgment and end up in hell or have to suffer a long time in purgatory. It seemed that his tower experience, where God gave him a new understanding of justification by grace alone, also resulted in a new perspective on the second coming. Again and again, he talked of the second coming, especially in his Christian sermons, but there were no longer any traces of fear. On the contrary, anyone who reads them senses a deep joy in anticipation of the greatest day in the history of the world. That's why Luther could now pray, Come, dear last day, by describing the last day with the word dear. The ring of fear no longer resonates in it. I need not fear something that has become dear to me. That's what he preached again and again. Now, how did Martin Luther come to this conviction? Two interpretations played a significant role. First, there was a dispute with the church in Rome and especially with the Pope. Luther had been condemned as a heretic, and at a political level, a growing alliance was also forming against the countries of the Reformation. On the 1st of July, 1523, Johann Esch and Heinrich Voss, two Augustinian monks from Antwerp in Belgium, had already been burned at the stake in Brussels for preaching Reformation doctrines. The whole Reformation was surrounded by enemies who wished nothing more than to see the end of all who were involved. Luther could only interpret this, all this as the great power of the Antichrist that was to arise shortly before the coming of Jesus. And then there was the fact that he was living at a time where Central Europe and thus all of Christendom had been threatened by the Islamic Ottoman Empire for decades already. In the fall of 1529, the armies of Suleiman I laid siege to the, to the important capital city of Vienna. Fear and, terrorists, fear, sorry, fear and terror spread across Europe. Only a great united army put together by countries that were otherwise so often at conflict with each other was able to avert the danger, aided by the fact that the Ottoman troops withdrew to their home country at the face of the coming winter. The development in these two areas was such a significant sign for Luther that he believed that they were the last events in the history of the world and that Christ would soon return. That gave him the courage to defend the Reformation and joyfully look forward to the day when all affliction would cease. But he didn't succumb to the temptation of naming an exact date for a final event, signalizing that the, the um, immediate coming of Christ. However, in the town of Lacau, only a few kilometers from Witt Wittenberg, where Luther lived, 
Um, one of Luther's colleagues named Michael Stifle calculated that the world would end on October 19, 1533, at 8 o'clock in the morning. That caused many people to panic, and Stifle was supposed to be arrested. But Luther put in good word for his colleague. Luther wrote that Stifle's calculation was only a little temptation for him, that he himself would rather wait for Jesus soberly and not overdo it with the anticipa anticipation. Sorry. But of course, he would also have liked to know when Jesus would finally come. In his later years, Luther tried to calculate when the history of the world would come to an end. He used a scheme that had arisen in early Judaism in which the history of the world was conceived as a great week of creation lasting 7,000 years. He undertook extensive historical calculations, which he published under this title, the title Supertatio Anorum Mundi, a summary of the world chronology. The result of his calculations were, Jesus Christ is coming back soon, preferably during my lifetime. But how important these thoughts were in his eyes is clearly demonstrated by the fact that he published a second edition in the year of his death, 1546. When he asked why he had, he had invested so much time and effort thinking about the return of Christ, he answered with the Latin words, por otium, which means so much as, it's my hobby. Um, I'd like to take this time to uh, break into another session of prayer. It's amazing how some people become real experts concerning their hobbies. For them, it's like when people are in love. As often as time and circumstances allow, their thoughts are with that special person. All of a sudden, you see the world differently. What used to be difficult becomes easy because you have a new motivation that wasn't there before. Your life now looks so different. That must have been what it was like for Luther concerning the second coming. The older he got, the greater his joyful longing for the dear last day became. And you don't have to wait until you're old. You can start today because waiting can be so exciting. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church, the grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven, but the unrighteous will unfortunately die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that Christ's coming is near. The time of that event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. So my appeal to you is that Jesus is coming. The times are telling it all. People are looking for peace. The joy of the reality of the second advent is abundant. I want to be part of that number that shall meet the Lord in the air. The question is, do you? Thank you. Sinners come while Christ is pleading. Now for you he's interceding. Hasten grace and time diminished Shall proclaim the mystery finished Lo, he comes Lo, Jesus comes Lo, he comes, he comes all glorious Jesus comes to reign victorious Lo, he Dear Heavenly Father, as we go our separate ways, ways, we pray that you will continue to inspire the youth of the church so that we can motivate others to lead their life towards you so that we can um, be ready for the second coming of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now